It's Captain Hooter. Good morning. Good morning. We look up acting. Buenos dias. Hello. Everybody online looking good. Morning. Sawadee krab. Good night. Dobro horanku. Bon dia. Como va? everyone, Hooter here, coming to you high and alive once again, getting ready to become a hero. And you know, speaking of heroes, today's guest was a real hero for me. Derek Bergman, head of the VOC. When I was in Amsterdam writing my book, this guy helped me in ways I can't even imagine. He knows more about what's going on in Amsterdam and in all the cities and all throughout the Netherlands with cannabis, more than anybody around. And today, we're going to get a chance to have a chat with him. But before that, I wanted to see if I could get some of my hero on. So I'm going to try the little, a little defense here. Check this out. I'm going to save the world. Let's go. See that guy? See that guy right there? everyone, Captain Hooter here, coming to you once again, very high and very alive, and really delighted today to have one of the true mentors that really helped me a great deal when I first went to Amsterdam. Uh, he's the head of the VOC. Uh, he is the man, the brain trust for cannabis legalization in the Netherlands, and it's Derek Bergman. How are you, sir? How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Thank you very much for that great introduction, Captain. <laughs> well, you you helped me. You saved me. Uh, you know, right in the beginning when I was putting together the whole concept of trying to write a book like this, uh, you were the, one of the first people that I had to go see because uh, you're like the Godfather there in the Netherlands, and and you knew everything about everyone, and you gave me the perfect advice and the right kind of guidance in order to to make that happen. And uh, you know, again, great. Thank My you. Pleasure. Now, now the thing is. Uh, you know, since I've, I, I, I took off uh, just before Christmas to come here to get warm, and since I left, all everything's went to hell there. What the hell is going on in the Netherlands right now? My God, man. <laughs> well, you, you could say uh, not too much is going on. Now, the main, the main news has been about our uh, wheat experiments that now the, the government has been, uh, has been working on since 2017. So five years in the making, and not a plant has been planted yet, not a seed has been put in the ground yet. And then the recent news was that there are, will be even more delays. So they, they were hoping to get the first legal weed in the experiment cities in the coffee shops this year, but now they think it will be the second half of 2023. And in the meantime, uh, as, as your viewers might uh, know, Germany is accelerating their legalization efforts. So what we are, what's in the, in the, what could be happening is that Germany will actually beat us to it. After we've had the coffee shops for like almost 50 years, then the Germans can, can have earlier, they'll have the legal weeds than, than we have. And we can get more into the, you know, the, 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 the idea behind the weed experiment and why it even got there. Uh, but, to me, the, 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 the short analysis would be that the, the government, they really um, painted, painted themselves in a corner by yeah. making such a bureaucratic monster out of this experiment 
and having so many rules and regulations that even if they do want to speed it up, it's it's almost impossible for them to do so because the rules are so tight. Everybody has to be to be checked to uh, behind the comma, and it's just it takes a lot of time. And for a country that is really quite capitalist country, you know, and free that we love the free markets here and the politics love free markets, there is hardly any of that. It's almost like a socialist communist experiment that they uh, are trying to. Uh, and the, the funny part is that whoever's in charge of the public relations did a really great job because most of the people around the world still thinks that weed is all just completely legal in, in the Netherlands. It's everybody I run into when I say, oh yeah, this is going on there and they're talking about stopping tourists and, and they go, what? I thought everything was legal there. It, it, they've, they, it, it's a complete whitewash as far as the, the knowledge base. You know, it's the same thing about Portugal here. I'm in Portugal. Everybody thinks everything's decriminalized here which it is, it's decriminalized, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can have anything. No distribution, yeah. no production. I know it, it's, it's similar indeed to, uh, to the situation yeah. in the Netherlands where people get it wrong. And it's not just your regular tourist or Joe Blow smoker that doesn't know about it. Even the, mm -hmm. like the German ministers, the, the, it's very funny. My colleague from Germany, uh, Georg Wurz, he, he runs a very big uh, legalization organization and he has uh, it's called Deutsche Handverband, so he has a news, uh, I think he does it bi-weekly or every week he has the news items on the on the YouTube, and he, he called out the, the minister who was explaining in parliament that, yeah, well, our, our, our great neighbor, the Netherlands, they have, uh, have found a way to legalize the wheat within the national, international conventions of the United Nations, and Georg <laughs> rightly explained this proves yeah. that this guy doesn't really know what he's talking about because we haven't legalized. So we are right. not really uh, going against the United Nation uh, treaties because it's still everything is formally uh, illegal. People really don't get it. Even Dutch people don't get if you buy your wheat in the coffee shop, you can you can buy a maximum of five grams. But if the policeman stops you in the street and frisks you, he can take all those five grams or the one gram that you buy. He, he is perfectly entitled to do so. And this yeah. is this is, of course, absurd that the whole idea yeah. behind this tolerance policy in the beginning, it started way back in 1976, is that this would be a temporary thing that they would sort of have this tolerance policy where they would not prosecute you for small amounts. And of course, the people who thought it up they, they thought we, we will improve the policy, we will take the next step so that it can be formally legal, so that, that, that you really are entitled to have this weed and to smoke it. But up to this day, the only thing, I, I tell this to people a lot, the only thing that is legal is to use it. Mm -hmm. that, that is not in, the, in our opium law. So you, 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 you don't uh, break any laws if you, if you smoke weed. But then I... In the past, I talked to uh, to this this woman who is now an alderman in the city of Breda, but used to work for the, the prosecutor's uh, office, and mm -hmm. and she made the argument: How is it possible to use cannabis if you do not possess cannabis? So she, so she said, yeah, he, because not not any amount is legal to possess. Really, that means that it's it's illegal to use it. So I'm. I don't, it's a philosophical argument, but that's, uh, yeah, up to this day, that's the only thing. And, and yep. now with the weed experiment, this is, it gets absurd, more absurd. Even this regulated weed that is still not here, that we expect for next year. If you buy that regulated legal weed in those experiment cities, it will still be illegal to own that weed and police can still take it off you. So yeah, that, that's uh, <laughs> that style. You know, you know, you you explained all the rules to me in the very beginning because I I had very grand uh, plans on how I was going to just sweep in and and uh, knock out all 169 coffee shops at that time. Uh, 169 coffee shops. I was just going to knock them out, and you went, "Oh no, my friend, you're not doing it like that. You're not not if you're going to do it legally." I had to get one gram from five different shops every day. It took months, months, and months to go through and do that correctly. To do it legally, I should say. Isn't 
the government receiving tons of taxes from all of the coffee shops from the sales of cannabis? No. They don't get any taxes from, from the... This, this, they do get a lot of taxes, but it's, well, it's a great story. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how, okay. how this went. We have okay. the value added tax for all the products like, like most countries have. You buy your bread in the shop and then 19% it goes, it goes to the government. That's your, your value added tax. If the product is illegal, however, formally, it, you cannot tax an illegal product like you cannot tax heroin or guns in this country that, that are illegal. So for, for quite some times, the coffee shops, they did pay this value added tax, but one of them in Amsterdam was really smart and thought this through, through and argued, well, cannabis is still formally technically illegal in the law. There's only the tolerance policy. So that would, should mean that the tax, the value added tax that I'm paying, I, this is not legal. So he went right. to say the tax uh, judge and explain all this shit. And the coffee <laughs> shop still exists. It's coffee shop Siberia in Amsterdam. So if you, if you go, uh, go visit, it's a nice old shop. <laughs> so this has, has been uh, known ever since as the Siberia arrest by the highest uh, court we have in the Netherlands. And since then, there has been uh, not one coffee shop that is paying this value added tax. So they do wow. pay the value added tax on anything that is not cannabis. So on the coffee and the soft drinks and whatever that they're selling. But of course, it's it's not much. And they pay like um, a profit tax. So at the end of the day, the profit that they make, they are taxed for that. But the, okay. the, the, the government could tax them even more if they legalize, because then they could have the profit tax, but also the value added tax on every single gram that they are selling. So they are losing well, out and they have been losing out really on, on millions and millions of, of euros of tax money just because they can't or they don't want to. That's a, that's another question. Really mm -hmm. legalize. And okay, my, that makes sense. Yeah, my own understanding has, uh, has always been because that's a question I get asked so many times by foreign journalists, especially, how is it possible that the Netherlands is now lagging behind where we were always the pioneers, now that America is legalizing Canada, where well, we know all these countries, Uruguay, Germany is, 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 is ready to do it, Malta has legalized. And to me, I, like I think it. it's, it's like a trauma that has, been, uh, that, that has been there ever since like the middle 90s, when the Netherlands got so much international criticism, especially from France, but also from Germany, most, most from France, they call this like a narco state just because of the coffee shops. It makes no sense whatsoever because France is, has always been like a big country, the, the harbor of Marseille, you know, the French connection, the heroin trade, their user uh, 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 figures are so much higher and were back then than the Netherlands. More people <laughs> use cannabis in France than in the Netherlands. A lot more people use harder drugs in France than in the Netherlands. So this criticism had no foundation in reality at all. But, but still, this, this sort of kicked off the repression wave in the Netherlands. You can say that when the policy was changed in 1976 up to the middle 90s, were like the, the golden age of cannabis when also the the Dutch wheat, you know, the NATO wheat uh, uh, came in there. But really the criticism, especially from France, that has caused the trauma with the government. And I think they, and also with the civil servants that are still in the ministry. And my uh, understanding has always been they are waiting for a huge, big European country to go first and legalize so that they don't have to be out there in front of the troops ever again, you know? They only want to follow, mm -hmm. they don't want to lead anymore. So that, that, that could be the explanation for it. And also the, what's in, what's, uh, what you really need to know with the experiment, why did the experiment even, uh, why was it thought up? And this has to do with the last government we had. We, we have our prime minister, he's already doing his fourth government right now, Mr. March. Yeah. He's been in power 12 years with four more to go. He'll be the longest sitting prime minister that we ever had in a, in a matter of months, then he'll have the record. So when he was forming his third government, so the last one before this, they had like the Christian parties, 
to the Liberal Party, which is his own party of Mr. Rutte, and mm -hmm. then D66, which is like the number one pro-legalization party. So mm -hmm. they, and th this is very common in Dutch politics. We never have a one party government. It always has to be coalition government. Right now we have 20 different parties in parliament. So the God. Dutch, they like their choice of parties. So this <laughs> makes it very, very difficult to form a majority government because you have to agree on the basic stuff. So mm -hmm. when they tried to agree on the cannabis policy, it, it, didn't, it didn't happen because the two Christian parties, they want to close down all the coffee shops and the D6060 party, they want to legalize cannabis and go on legalizing ecstasy as well. So mm -hmm. they got into this stalemate where they could not find any compromise or any common ground on the cannabis policy. And then the fourth party, the Liberal Party, some of their, one of their guys, <laughs> he literally said, well, if you can't co come to an agreement on it, you know what you got to do? You just make an experiment. Mm. So this is, this is from the very start, 100% political tool, just a trick to, to, to not have a decision and to, to keep right. all the four uh, parties in the government. So for me, it, you could call it like a stillborn child, you know? Nobody, is, <laughs> nobody wants this experiment. The government really doesn't want it. The, the coffee shops don't want it. It's not good for the consumers. And it makes no sense. Like, like we say here as a, as a joke, but it's really true. We've been having an experiment since 1976. And right. the main <laughs> outcome is, please, if you're gonna sell it in the shop, make it regulated to produce it and to wholesale it because there are no leprechauns who are coming to the coffee shop every night to, to, to get the weed out there you know it has to come from somewhere and this yeah, yeah this this is the leprechauns big, this is the big <laughs> hole in our policy and this is the only thing that they have to resolve and if they want mm -hmm. to know how to regulate a market they can go to canada they can go to california they could learn of course also from the mistakes that, that are made there. But it's sure. really crazy to say we have to experiment, you know. They they even mm. had a law that had a majority in our, uh, like, second chamber, our House of, uh, House of Representatives, if you compare it to America. There, there was a majority before this experiment was there to regulate it for the whole country. It just had mm. to go to our Senate, and they were waiting for that, and boom. Then we had this experiment. Like they pulled it out of the magician's head. Like this is a new yeah. Here we have an experiment for 10 cities. Why, you know? You know, it's funny because as soon as I heard about, you know, essentially the government getting into the, the, the weed growing business, the very first thing I thought about was uh, uh, the gentleman that was the uh, uh, Meyer Lansky. You know, the guy that was the uh, the accountant for uh, the mafia. And they had a great quote for him uh, uh, that they had in that movie. And uh, uh, the gentleman asked him about, you know, how tough it was being in the mafia or something like that. He says, let me tell you something. He says, alcohol, gambling, prostitution, and drugs. In the future, the government will control all of these. You know why? Because that's where the money is. And so, yeah. And so when I heard the government was partnering up with some of these organizations and growers and, and a couple of the coffee shop owners to, to do this experiment, it was the first thing I thought about. Because I, again, was asking the question aren't they already making money from taxes from the coffee shops? And that's what the missing element was for me. But they're not really partnering, you know? It's mm -hmm. also the, the most, uh, like a lot of newspapers and news media here, they, they talk about stats wheat. So state wheat, which mm -hmm. I really hate. It's a term coined by a really conservative bad newspaper, the whole, you know, uh, government wheat, because right. all the government is doing is, is like they are doing in all the, the countries and the American states that, that have legalized, is giving the rules that they have to adhere to to, to make to be in the wheat experiment. So there's no, no government or no uh, civil servant ever gonna plant anything. And you can see that now because, okay, they, they have the space for 10 growers. 
and now they have all been selected. They have been selected first by like a pre-selection and, and then a lottery. How about that? Right. Some really yeah. good companies that could, would have been great making the wheat. Yeah, but they uh, were unlucky with the lottery, you know, so they are not in there. Right. But you can see out of these 10 that have come through and that have won the lottery, there are five foreign companies or, or they took over the, the Dutch company that made it in the lottery. So we're having wow. this Dutch wheat experiment. 50% is already foreign. So <laughs> I, I don't mind it that much. You know, I drink Coca-Cola as well. But I would say if you want a Dutch experiment for your Dutch coffee shop, maybe you should have thought about this before. Do you, mm. do you think it's a good thing that all this Cana mostly Canadian money is now going here? Aurora, for instance, they're doing very bad in Canada. But hey, they can make a few bucks here if, if they play their cards right. So this is the, the, the government, like I explained, for them, it was like a, almost a political trick to have this experiment and not have it mm -hmm. the normal way so that all the coffee shops could do it. And now, of course, we will have to, the very strange situation if this wheat ever arrives in those coffee shops, that in 10 cities, you will have clean wheat that you will know for sure what's in there, you know, and the percentages mm -hmm. of THC and everything. And, okay. and in the 90 other cities that are not in the experiment, including all the big cities, including Amsterdam, you, you will still have the same thing. So this, okay. the, I, I would agree that this is an experiment because what, what will happen? And also what would be interesting uh, to have any cannabis products outside the regulated growers will be forbidden for the, for the coffee shops that are in the experiment. So they are all now, like every Dutch coffee shop, importing their hash, mostly mm -hmm. from Morocco and from a bit from, from Nepal and Afghanistan. This will mm -hmm. be prohibited. They will can only sell Dutch-made hash. And we all mm -hmm. know that we have some development, you know, on, on, the, on the production of, of hash, but it cannot be modern concentrates because those right. are still off limits anyway, anywhere in the coffee shop. The, the, the problem with the concentrates, why are they forbidden, is that when they changed the law in 1976, the, 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 this is the main thing, is that they said, you have the cannabis products on the one end, and you have all the other illegal drugs on the other end. And we're going to make the, the punishment higher for the other drugs, and we're going to make the punishment lower or tolerate the, the personal use, etc., just for the cannabis, because, rightly so, there is a big difference. It's impossible to overdose on cannabis was one of their main arguments to make the distinction. So, mm -hmm. but, the, but then they, they had this, this one exception where they said that the hash oil, which we, you could like the more traditional old school hash oil that we had back in the 70s, they excluded right. that from this law. So it was mm -hmm. cannabis flour and hashish. This was all covered in the law. But the hash oil, they figured it's so like concentrated and small and easier to, uh, to smuggle as well, that they left this out and they never changed that. And so technically what they say now is that like a modern concentrate, like a dab, is really a, a form of hash oil, which you, you could argue maybe that it is, you know. But in a way, of course, it makes no sense because like, as we know, traditional hash, you, you sieve it, you know, or you make the water ash, which is, the water ash is also okay, mm -hmm. you know, it's within the bounds of the policy. But the modern concentrates uh, are not. And this also right. goes for the, the products, of course, that you can make with the concentrate. So modern edibles that, that are very well known and, and popular in America and in Canada, they are all off limits here. Because like mm -hmm. everything, anything that you, what you, the only thing that you can sell is like space cake made like the traditional way with, uh, I think there even has to be like parts of the plants still. Yeah, or, you know, it's gnarly. Or something. So it's, yeah. what's so stupid about that is of course, I know a lot of people, including my own wife, but also a lot of stories, that especially with the old fashioned, old school space cake, where you don't have a clue how much is in there, people okay. fall off that chair, you know? People, <laughs> people have a bad trip on that old school uh, space cake. I, I tend to, mm -hmm. to not eat it uh, too much. And if you compare mm -hmm. those to the modern edibles where you are sure that there is like 10 milligrams, 30 milligrams. Specific dosing. 
yeah, then you know what you're gonna gonna expect. So again, this is such a, uh, another example of the policy really making no sense because it makes products unsafer the way that that the right. government is treating. And I was going to say, you know, during last year's Jack America Cup, we had a, a roundtable discussion and, and Mila was there and uh, uh, the girls from uh, uh, the Bulldog and uh, Bora Youngins were there and a uh, young man, uh, Jonathan Hirsch from Canada, who's a concentrate expert. And he was arguing extremely well about the fact that out of all of the possible cannabis options that are out there, you really want to give dabs to grandma yeah. because dabs are out of everything, the most harm, you know, the least amount of heat, the least amount of particulates, which are the two things we talk about when you're inhaling something, and the fact that you can dose it and be accurate about your dosing. So you can give grandma that, you know, that, that 10 uh, milligrams of, uh, of uh, 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 even giving specific uh, THCP or THCO now, which they have uh, that's readily going around in the United States. Um, so anyway, that, that, that covers that issue. I wanna continue with the THCP and the THCO. That is like one of the hottest topics going around right now, especially in the United States. And now it's starting to be important in the Netherlands because of Renus, right? Yep. And the new water I that he water. has. Yeah, it's great. Eh? <laughs> Outstanding. Uh, can you give me some feedback? Tell me what it sounds, what it feels like there in the Netherlands right now. What, what do you think is gonna happen with that? Now it's it's very very interesting. Uh, Rinus, uh, he was gracious enough to include me in like this very small pool of journalists that, that he had that could uh, have like advanced knowledge of his project, so the waterfall mm -hmm. project as he called it. So I was also in on the like the YouTube uh, sessions that he did with his testing group of three hundred patients uh, of of the yeah. members of his Souvenuver uh, club that were testing out this this new uh, water product and. So he did have coverage in the national media as well on this. And of course, what's so great about it is that ever since the Volkskrant, a national newspaper here called in the Robin Hood of cannabis, this has stuck. You know, journalists also like mm -hmm. this sort of a way to, to put a name uh, on somebody. So um, I, I would say that he has like favorable uh, media attention. And I also think that the, the prosecutor's office will be very, very um, careful if they prosecute him again. Mm -hmm. so it, I think right now, and this has happened before, eh, because with, when he was standing out the cannabis oil, and as we talked about, this is illegal because it's like yeah. the, the definition of the hash oil. He, he had to wait a long time before they finally, finally, you know, prosecuted him. And he, he mm -hmm. did a lot of interviews where he said, I'm ready. Let the police come. This is my yeah. goal. I want to be prosecuted. I want to have, you know, clarity on the issue. So mm -hmm. I, I sort of suspect that this will happen uh, too. I don't expect the, the prosecutor's office to go in there fast. And uh, I know from the more practical, technical side it, that, it, that it's hard with the idle water because it's um, it's sort of a yeah it's technically legal also that, that, yeah, that, that's also yeah but then again i don't know if yeah. they if they will would buy that and if they would not take the chances to see if the judge uh, approve of that that idea sure and then have you tried it not yet not yet no not yet okay so, so i gotta take i I had him on the show and we did a whole interview about the, the whole process and everything and he um uh, afterwards, I became intrigued by it because I had never heard of the process before. I knew about the nanotechnology and I had heard about encapsulating, uh, but I didn't, I had never heard the whole process, yeah. the Trojan horse effect, right? And since then, I've spoken to probably a dozen different people who are now taking this, uh, using this water on a regular basis. And I have to tell you that just from my own product review uh, standard, it would be getting five stars on uh, on Uber Eats. Uh, <laughs> everyone seems to love this water. Um, the one friend of mine who I know who's a regular daily smoker, smokes all day, every day, dab, smokes, everything ridiculous. He said that his, uh, his smoking uh, amount that he smokes has went down by half. And he's been, he's been using the water now for a month, a little oh. over a month. And he says, I can just tell you, not through any kind of intentional reason, I've just 
not felt the necessity to smoke as much, uh, taking my little uh, shots with the water. So I'm excited as hell, to be honest with you. I've got to, I've got to make sure I've got the right medical condition uh, in place for me to <laughs> get myself locked into a, a proper prescription there. No, um, I do think that if you just become a member of Suvaniva, you can just order. They're not too boom. picky with, uh, you know, they will send it to you. I'm in. I'm in then. I'm, I'm locking that up. And <laughs> have you, um, you know, the, one of the things that, that has been going around here recently, uh, go again, which kind of triggered the question about aren't they making money on the coffee shops, has been a story that there's a discussion about closing off the coffee shops to tourists, A, and about shutting down the red light district after a certain hour uh, I've heard both of those stories. Can you can you give us an update? Is it is that real? Are they really thinking about doing that? They are indeed really thinking about doing it. But if you go back to the the, or the origins of the, the 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 tourist ban idea for coffee shops, you have to go back ten years already. So it was <laughs> it was a very right wing uh, minister of justice who came up with this idea and who actually also implemented it. And now we get into this fantastic uh, Dutch style uh, politics. So I think in, in 2012, they introduced it in the law, but only for the three Southern provinces. Now I happen to live in one of these three Southern provinces here in Brabant, which is one of the best provinces we have in the Netherlands. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yep. back then I was amazed. How can this be legal or, or you know justified to say, oh, we have this law, but we will only put it in place in like this part of the country. So this is how it started. Then in 2013, nine years ago, it, it, it went sort of national. Then it, it, then it was in the law for, for the whole country. Every coffee shop had to ban tourists. But there's a catch, a good catch in, in, this, uh, in this instance. They said, but the local authorities, they are the ones that get to decide how they are going to enforce this new rule. <laughs> because Amsterdam, when they still had a, had a good mayor, <laughs> as opposed to the one we have right now, he's, he immediately went on the, on the Dutch TV when this idea was first put forward. He said, we could never have this in Amsterdam. This might be a good idea for a small town that is right on the, on the border with Germany or Belgium, but, but they get only the, the, the tourists there. But, but for Amsterdam, all hell will break loose. The whole reason we have the coffee shops is so that we don't have so many dealers on the street offering wheat and hash to, to everybody like we used to have in the early 70s before the coffee shops were there. So this was a guy who knew his stuff, the mayor back then. We, actually, two subsequent mayors had this position. They said, we will never enforce this in Amsterdam, no way, because... It, it just be one huge present to all the dealers and the black market and 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 we now have a good arrangement for it mm -hmm. so then we have the, the new mayor which is very ironically the first female mayor that we ever had in amsterdam in the 700 year history or so of the town and she's from the green left party which is one of the most progressive left-leaning pro-legalization political parties we have in the country. Okay. And it's it's this woman, Femke Halsema, who started putting this idea like years, years after it was introduced. And now, because I forgot to tell you this, hardly any city enforces this ban. Like my own city, Eindhoven, they enforced it for three years, had so much trouble with it that they stopped enforcing it. And this is what happened in most towns. In most towns, they never enforced it to begin with. And yeah. in some towns that did enforce it, they rolled it back because it makes no sense whatsoever. So most people were quite surprised when, when Femke Halsema, the new mayor of Amsterdam, said, yeah, we must be also, we must, to, because this is what, what, what's, what's behind it. There is so much pressure on the old center and the, especially on the red light district in Amsterdam from so many tourists really clogging up the place. They're making a mess, puking in the streets, whatever. We have to somehow curb this. But of course, especially if you use the example of puking in the streets and pissing in yeah. the streets, 
it's the goddamn <laughs> drunken people that do this. Yes. You know? Yes. So if if you would make a rule that made any kind of sense, you would go, you know, for the alcohol. Yeah. But okay, apart from this, <laughs> her approach has always been and still is, we need to have everything on the table. Any kind of measure that we can implement to, to have less pressure of the of the, the tourists, what they call low quality tourists in Amsterdam, <laughs> we have to consider. <laughs> So for one thing that they consider, and this, they, there is an example of this in, in a German city called Cologne, is mm. what they could also do is, is you know, uh, move all the prostitutes from the red light district to a big building on the outskirts of the town, where mm. then you'd want, because that's, I know the red, district, uh, red light district quite well, and I do come there often because like Cannabis College is also in yep. that same area the hash museum is in the same area so i know it if you come there especially at night you see that that the main draw that really attracts the huge yeah. crowds it is it is like the prostitution and the, the ladies sitting there behind the window it's very uncommon you know and it's very mm -hmm. famous the, the, if you visit amsterdam as a as a foreigner you do want to see it because it's it's so special and unique so mm -hmm. what you do get is, is like large tour groups of, of like 50 Japanese people that are following their tour guides going through these very, very narrow streets there. And indeed, clogging up the place, taking pictures of the ladies that they, re they really don't like that, you know, so it's, mm -hmm. it's obnoxious for them as well. So mm -hmm. you could say that there is, you, you cannot deny that the pressure is there and that the, the, that some inhabitants of Amsterdam, they are complaining and have been complaining for a while. But if you want to have solutions for this problem, you should look at how did we get in this situation. Schiphol mm -hmm. is one of the biggest airports in the world one of, and the biggest maybe even in Europe apart from London. And this has been policy. They want to be the airport hub for everybody you know, that has to change planes. They want to do it at Schiphol, so they buy their shit there in the tax-free stores. This has been policy for a long time. Another element there, the, the, the cheap flights that, 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 no, that never existed before that are now very common. For 20 euros, you can fly to Amsterdam from, from most capitals in Europe. Yeah, of course, you're going to get a lot of, say, low quality or budget tourists, no matter what you call it, it's going to lead to an influx there. Airbnb mm. and cheap hotels, it's the same thing. If there's so much cheap uh, lodging, it's going to be filled. You see it in Barcelona, you see it in Prague, you see it in the big touristy cities of Europe. Venice is, a, is maybe the, the most uh, famous example where they get right. 20 million tourists. Hardly anybody is living in Venice anymore. It's like mm -hmm. a big Disneyland that's just overrun by tourists and they have to think, well, you know, how, Captain Huda, how many coffee shops are there in Venice? Yeah. Zero. But still, they got even more tourists and more problems than here in Amsterdam. So mm -hmm. this, this is like the background why they are, why, why they are discussing this. And um, in the beginning, I thought because she, she is from such a progressive party that maybe it's all political tactics. Right. She wants... Uh, her, her, her people that criticize her, politicians that criticize her, that she wants to prevent them from saying the new mayor is soft on drugs. Right. So they should yeah, I had heard that too. The table. But mm -hmm. I don't know if this theory is true because I, I watched this closely, of course, because it would be such a big story if they would be so stupid to actually implement it. <laughs> and one of mm -hmm. the last things she said about it is uh, there's another example of, a, of a, a policy measure that she implemented that was not popular in the city council and that is what they call uh, uh, preventive frisking. So then they, they will frisk people looking for, for weapons with, with no real cause, you know, and they can do it wow. in certain areas, whatever. So the city council was against this because <laughs> yeah, you can understand what will probably happen. A lot of racial profiling, you know, and they will just go yeah. after, after the wrong people or whatever. But even though the city council was against it, she still uh, did this experiment, had the police do, do this frisking. And now recently she said that with this the tourist ban for coffee shops, she doesn't want to do it the same as with the frisking. So it, she said if there is no majority support in the city council 
I will probably not do it. Mm. So this is a, a glimmer of hope that the reason mm. that you know reason will prevail here. But mm -hmm. uh, indeed, like the, and some of the measures they are already implementing. And my idea about this is, and you can see it if you visit the red light district. Mm. Where are the police to actually, if somebody does something that is, uh, you know, <laughs> is breaking the law, mm -hmm. you can just give them a ticket. We have it in the law that if you are openly drunk and, you know, screaming or puking or pissing in someone against somebody's house, you mm -hmm. can give them a ticket or you can even right. take them to the police office because it's in the law. And if they would do that. I think then you, you you just attack what what is the real problem? People mm -hmm. being obnoxious and breaking the law there, and thinking that there are no laws in Amsterdam uh, whatsoever. But um, so it's it's hard to say. I would still, if if you put a gun to my head, I would say no, they will not do it. But I did also talk to one uh, member that's in the city council that is that, that is a proponent of, of this nonsense. And he, at one point, when, I, when we were arguing about it, he, he told me, yeah, maybe you are right, and it will lead to more problems, you know, with the black market and dealing. But hey, then we can just roll it back again, and at least uh, we tried the measure. So that's, I would say, a very uh, irresponsible way of, of doing politics. But maybe that's, that's how it will turn out, that they will try it for a short period of time. And what everybody is, uh, you know, is saying hmm. uh, and predicting that it that it will be a total uh, disaster. It will be a total disaster, and then they can. Then, of course, they could say after that forever, we did try this. It was a disaster. Let's not ever talk about it uh, again. And then yeah. one of the one of the things that is in the discussion all the time, and this is, uh, yeah, relevant. I think we. You, you, would be good if you could do a poll with your podcast. The idea yeah. is if if tourists know that they are no longer welcome in the coffee shops, will they come to Amsterdam anyway or will they mm. not come to Amsterdam anymore? And my guess yeah. would be that what people come to Amsterdam for is not only the coffee shops, it's the whole package. You know the city. Yes. Well, Captain. <laughs> It's a yes. good city, you know, you have museums, you have the nice atmosphere, you have good eating, you have a lot of things that, 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 mm -hmm. that, that are a draw. And of course, the coffee shops are a great bonus, you know, they, are, they could yes. be one of the main reasons that you go there. But, and so that's one of the, one of the things I think could happen if they do implement. And, oh, and of course, it will still be possible to buy wheat in Amsterdam if you are not allowed in the coffee shops anymore. So oh, many sure. people, well, but they could even buy just the, the cannabis in the coffee shop, stand 10 meters away from it and offer it to the tourists like that. You can make, mm -hmm. make some money, you know? This is what Damn. happened in the cities that tried it. Okay, lots of things to, to, uh, to comment on here. First of all, I lived right on the main Voorstraat there, you know, that was right across from the, the greenhouse. So I was right on the borderline of Sodom and Gomorrah, so to speak. Um, <laughs> and I had a chance to see daily um, behavior, behavior of tourists. And it, 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 with any consistent observation, you will learn that there is zero violence, zero aggressiveness, zero anything from the coffee shops, and 100% of issues with the pubs and the places that are serving predominantly beer and alcohol after hours on that side of town. And when I say that side of town, I'm talking about where the red light district is and across from that side, on that side of the Domstrat. And what you see it primarily is on Friday and Saturday and sometimes Sunday nights, usually when there's a uh, some sort of a sporting event that is going on, usually right after a group of sailors has also come in from one of the militaries or something, which also adds into the whole um, uh, 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 endorphin uh, explosion that takes place. But then you, you have a formula where you start to see issues. It has been my experience that the police have been incredibly good. And when I say incredibly good is, I mean, incredibly fast. You won't see them anywhere. And then something will happen and police are there and like, 
two seconds. And I've seen some remarkable policing also. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. At one point, I saw a group of four guys who were drunk uh, and, and who had, uh, uh, I think they went and climbed into their car in order to smoke inside the car. And they got in the car. And the first thing that happened was one police officer showed up at one corner of the car about two minutes later, another police officer showed up at the other corner of the car. Another two minutes and then two more police officers were on the back corner and they didn't do anything. They just stood there. And eventually they had to get out of the car. Once they got out of the car, they were aggressively moved to the wall. Uh, they searched through the car and then they took the car away. Wow. And they took the car away and then left. There you go. Uh, Go enjoy your party, I guess. Those guys were left standing there. They were all very upset, <laughs> but they just took their car and said, where that, and I went, that's good policing. I like that. Take take away the, the, the vehicle. We can do some damage with them. Um, to answer the question about what do people come to Amsterdam for? It is an entourage of all of those things. And it used to include magic mushrooms. Yep. And it no longer includes magic mushrooms. Now it includes the truffles. Um, which is different um, than the actual magic mushrooms. And uh, as far as the drugs being available, everywhere you go in Amsterdam, in any of those streets, you're going to be able to have access to any kind of drug that you can imagine. They're all, those drug dealers are already there. They're in place. They're Good ghosts. Point. Yeah, they're already ghosts. You don't see them. You they'll, they're moving all the time. They're and and it's it's an art form of how easy it is to, to get any kind of a drug while you're there. You know, because it's, what you it's, don't understand, of course, or, or realize with these dealers, the, the five gram uh, maximum that you can have without being prosecuted is of course great, because they the, all they they will have like five grams on them. And then the, what's more, they can buy it in the shop or, or maybe hide it somewhere where the police can find it. So that even if the police will, will frisk them, they, they can't do anything about it if it's more than five grams. Yeah, they can take the five grams, but they, mm -hmm. it'd be very hard for them to arrest it. And here, what was interesting is the main city, I would say, and the biggest city that actually enforces this ban and has enforced it since the beginning is Maastricht which is our most Plastic, southern city, yeah. is surrounded by Germany and Belgium. It's way down in the south. So it's very peculiar. If you, if you look at the map in the Netherlands, it's like this mm -hmm. appendix-like thing that's going down into the other countries, <laughs> like an enclave. Mm -hmm. and, and this is at, at the southern tip of this is Maastricht. So if, yeah, it's a very special city. And through the centuries, Belgians and Germans have come there to the market, to everything, everywhere. But when they first uh, started uh, enforcing this tourist ban there, on national TV, there a few of these uh, dealers, a lot of them were like Moroccan Dutch, they were happy to be openly out there in the street being filmed with really wads of cash, big, big <laughs> stacks of money saying, thank you, government, this is great <laughs> for us, we make so much money and now it's great, wonderful. So it, yeah, for us as yeah. activists, this this was like gold because there's no better way to, to prove our <laughs> point that what we are saying theoretically was happening practically there. And then of course, if these are like stable people, it's all good. But after a few weeks, there were all there was also a report on TV with this um, uh, like this social worker. <clears throat> that that worked with like problematic youth who, who are in and out of jail and who have all kinds of trouble. And he said, and he was almost in tears about it. He said, years and years of work that we put into getting these guys on the right path and going to school or having a job, it's all fucked up now because it's so easy for them to go out on the street and make money on the tourists selling their weed. And yeah. all our work is totally in vain. And then I thought... How can a national government be so stupid to, to, to make this kind of a rule and have really no idea about the effects there? And for me, I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, 50 years old, so I, I can remember Amsterdam in like the early 80s before there were, there were a lot of coffee shops. Oh. There were some streets there that really I didn't like to go to because it was really not a nasty atmosphere there, you know? And so many dealers Scary. every every five meters you would be asked if you want to buy uh, hashish but also heroin cocaine and speed whatever 
you would yeah. really avoid these streets. And this, you are right that there are dealers there, man. They, but but the whole uh, atmosphere of it and the, the threatening atmosphere, it, it's it's gone, you know. And it's really yeah. because of the coffee shop. Because I would still argue most people that uh, want to, to just smoke a joint, you know, want, want to just yeah. buy weed. Of course, other people want to buy other things as well. But I would still say the majority, the bulk of people. And of course, it's better and easier if you're a consumer uh, to buy it in a coffee shop than, than, than buy it right on the street there with all the risks, you know. So, you know, the saddest part of the whole thing, the saddest part of the whole thing is that for all intents and purposes, the world has believed that Amsterdam has this, this legal cannabis market and has these legal lounges where people can come in and, and have this. And that's the best, for 30 years, everybody thought this is the best that Amsterdam can do. Yeah. And the truth is, first of all, it's, it's not even close to as good of a job that Amsterdam could do, they've had their hands tied behind their back the entire time sure. and every step that anybody's taken. Now, we fast forward and you go and take a look in Barcelona. Now you have an environment in Barcelona where they are allowed to do this. And you've seen some of the lounges and how they've, 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 they've grown. And Barcelona has arguably come right up to where Amsterdam is and now is starting to move by right and uh the it's kind of showing amsterdam what this could be and what this market can be and even and here's the funny part even they are working with their hands tied behind their back really. yeah because it's also you know a area really there is yes. no law that regulates cannabis social clubs or cannabis clubs in in spain but they right the, but they it, it's very interesting, I, I would say, to compare the two uh, models, because what's, what's very typical, of course, of the clubs, even in Barcelona, is that they are so discreet. You can walk past them without knowing even that they are clubs. You won't smell yep. a thing, you know. And from uh, I use this, this uh, example of the Bullock uh, often. I, I, I know Hank de Vries. I, I, love, uh, I love the guy, you know, and he's, he's built this great company. But yeah. still... In, why did he take like a bulldog showing his teeth as a logo to the world? It's so typical where, where it's really, it's in your face. It's like, here we are. We like this cannabis and we'll, 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 we'll sell it here in, in, in this shop. And that's a very, very different approach from, uh, from Barcelona. And I think that for people who know nothing about cannabis and are a bit conservative, it's easier to win them over if you say, Hey, what's your problem with this club? You know, it's 18 plus, you have to be, or 21 plus, you have to be a member. You can, nobody is outside smoking a joint. You cannot look into these establishment and see at all that somebody is using cannabis. So th this is all different in the, in the Netherlands. And I would, would argue that for a lot of uh, countries in Europe, the, the, the Spanish model, uh, the, the discreteness of it, would be would make it uh, would make the adaptation easier and also faster you know mm -hmm. because sure I, I know that 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 for uh, a lot of people they they see the dutch model almost as a negative example because it's too yeah it's too open and mm -hmm. but, uh, you can defend it as well because it's it's not just with the coffee shops but it's really in our nation's uh, character i would say to, to be open about everything. That's also why the prostitutes are, are right there in the window and why mm -hmm. we don't hide stuff because that's that's a bit who we are. And it can be offensive uh, to people who are more used to uh, being more discreet. If you only yes. look at the difference between our like Southern neighbor, Belgium, they are so close, you know, they speak the same language half of the country, but, but, but they are so different in character. The, the way that, mm -hmm. that Dutch people are, are so in your face and just say, yeah, here's the weed shop, uh, deal with it. it. It couldn't be further from the Belgian uh, style. So it's interesting to see whether um, in the future as Europe legalizes, and, and of course I'm looking at Germany uh, especially, what will their coffee shops slash clubs slash dispensaries be like? Will there oh. be consumption on site? Will tourists be allowed? How much can they buy? You, if there's anything we know about the Germans, if they do something, 
they do it right. They yeah, have baby. a word for it, gründlich, which means yes. like thorough. They won't leave any gray area there. They will not make a law where they say, well, you can sell it, but hey, uh, you are not allowed to produce it. No, no, no. They will make a system that works like they make, you know, the cars that work in every little detail. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to, about uh, that prospect. I'm watching very closely. Also, I have some activist friends, of course, in Germany, and I, I know their priorities where they're fighting for is home growth, for one thing. This will be so important for the rest of Europe oh. and the rest of the world. If Germany goes for home growth in a reasonable way, how can they still evict people here in my home country, which happens here every day, thousand times every year that they evict, evict people just for growing cannabis? Well, and also, I think what, they're, what we're all going to find out in the long run is the small batch cannabis grown by experts is going to be the most premium buds that you're going to be able to get. You know, the, all the little Picassos and the little Van Gogh are, who are growing on their balconies are the guys that you actually want. That That's the premium, premium bud. You know, it's it's also one of the, the interesting things about Amsterdam and Barcelona right now is how both of them are maintaining their price structures for the cannabis. Um, you can still can go into multiple coffee shops in uh, both of those cities and find California buds being sold for 30 euros a gram or four or, or even more. Yeah. And in California right now, you can buy a pound of the most premium, premium, premium California best, just death blow buds for $350 a pound. Wow. wow. There is such a glut of the market. I, I had Mark Emery on uh, this weekend and in Canada, he's paying 350 a pound for stuff, same pound that he paid two years ago, $3,500 a pound for the same exact buds. There's just this glut that's, that's there. Too much, almost. There's way too much. Uh, and, and here, uh, it, and it blows my mind because when I, I was in Barcelona last time and I said 30 euros, and this isn't even real California. This isn't from California. This is a California cultivar that's been grown well here. Um, and, but what was also strange is that it was in a pre-sealed package. Oh, yeah. Now that is, I'm getting ready to do a, a, a session here at this uh, Can of Portugal event, and I'm talking about the best practices of cannabis clubs and dispensaries and uh, herb houses, et cetera, around the world. And one of the premium advantages to buying buds in the Netherlands is the fact that it's almost all deli style. You're able to go in and pick out and see your bud and pick it and say, I want that bud. Now, it's highly likely that the bud tender is going to grab the bud with all five of his fingers in order to pick off that little piece of stem on the end of it. but you can correct that, um, <laughs> but these are these are this huge advantage. And when you talk to people from Canada and California right now, they've lost the ability, for the most part, to be able to pick out their buds anymore. But the wheat experiment this is exactly what they are uh, what they are doing, what they have to do. It's all prepackaged. Yeah. They, 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 there's so much because I. Uh, <laughs> For a Canadian company, uh, I translated the, all the paperwork that was necessary to go for one of these uh, uh, grower licenses for in the mm -hmm. experiment. I translated it from, uh, from Dutch to uh, English. So I know all these stupid rules. And they do have like, uh, after some lobbying, that you can have like small packages that you can use to, to, uh, to show it to your customer so that he can actually smell the product. No, but the, but the style we have right now that you just have like big jars or whatever and then it's picked from there. I, I hope it will survive in the in the future, but yeah. if you look at the experiment, it's not going to. I love the fact that there's some testing. I, I think having some sort of testing is a good thing. Uh, so if nothing else, you know that the batch uh, that, you know, whoever, wherever it came from had a chance to be looked at. Uh, I do remember there was a, the, the boat uh, coffee shop in Utrecht Yep. Um, they, they've been uh, doing uh, some sort of a, a report for years now, True. right? And I'm not sure how accurate. Illegal too. Yeah, you know that illegal. 
that Dizzy Duck, for instance, in uh, in The Hague, which is also a very great uh, coffee shop, they've been testing yes. it also. But uh, yeah, formally they cannot do it. And uh, when I talk to politicians, they they are really surprised by that. They they have no clue that, that it's that it's forbidden for coffee shops to even test on pesticides to to get their weed or, or a sample of their weed to to a formal laboratory to get it tested for pesticides. That's crazy. It's forbidden. They cannot do it. Yeah, and it's and and okay. All right. So let me tell you what I'm doing. I, I'm I'm waving a magic wand, and poof. You are now prime minister, okay? And and you run, you run and 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 win the party on this platform. What's going to be the first things you do to fix this? And also being realistic because you've been to more meetings, and you know how this government works, you oh, yeah. and how it doesn't work yeah. better than anybody. So so what needs to happen? How do, how do you make this happen so that it works out the way it should work out for everyone? I think what they should, should make, do is make it like a comprehensive cannabis law. Because now the, the approach that they take is like they want to legalize or regulate the back door of the coffee shop. And that's only like a, a part of the puzzle. You need home growing in there. You need medical in there as well. Uh, one of the problems here is that for a while uh, this was covered by health insurance. If you had medical cannabis with a prescription, the, it, that's gone. There's not one insurance company that, that, that will cover medical cannabis, although we had medical cannabis here 20 years. So you need a comprehensive law for that. And I would say the one of the main principles would be, like my good uh, friend uh, Duda, who sadly passed away uh, from Friesland, the, the, the famous grower always said, he called it the beer and wine model. And it boils down to right now, if you want to produce your own beer, you can. There's no license needed, nothing. If you're an adult, you can make as much beer as you want. You can drink it. You can share it with your friends. That's all legal. But if you want to sell it in any uh, way through the internet or a shop, then there some rules apply. And you have to pay some tax about it and it should be checked that you are putting out a healthy product. If, if we could have that same principle for weed, it'd be great. So if you have a very big garden, there is no problem if you put 200 plants in there because it's your own garden. You know? And right. then I would say for the, the professional part of it is especially looking at the experiences in Canada and uh, the US, you really need to protect the small grower. You need you have to have active regulation to prevent uh, Mac marijuana, basically. Have just a few right. huge conglomerate companies like it's now with, with beer, for instance. Now beer, it's of course you have the craft industry, but the, there are some examples where you uh, yeah, where there's only a few companies that, that do pretty much everything. So that for regulation, I would say make smart regulation where you're not like in America have to pay a huge amount to just buy the license. It, that, that makes no sense, you know? Right. Like, it, like in, in any uh, producing, it should be, okay, if you're good at it and you are, uh, you are an entrepreneur, you should be able to, to, to join the market. And if your product is good, you, you will grow like it is in any market. So th mm -hmm. that would be my main, main guidelines for it. And uh, I would say with so much changing around the world, this could also be a realistic, uh, quite realistic, you know? Why not? Mm -hmm. the, 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 right. the rules that we have right now are so stupid. That's one thing that, that the politicians do agree on. The way we have it organized right now, it makes no sense whatsoever. We really need to change it. And of course, that's it's like a first step. If everybody agrees that it's not good the way it is right now, then you get some some room for change. But uh, I I recently did an article for uh, NCOT, the European uh, Organization NGO for Better Drugs Policy. Check them out, uh, ncot.org. And the title of the, it was an update on Dutch policy, and uh, I used a lyric by uh, NWA, moving like a tortoise with rigor mortis. That's the way our <laughs> cannabis policy is now uh, moving forward. So we are moving <laughs> forward, but it's not very fast.
What about the what about the magic mushroom thing? What happened? That was now for a long time. People came to Amsterdam when they came to get their killer buds. They also came and grabbed some mushrooms and uh, uh, ate a couple of grams and did a walk around town usually until dawn. And uh, you know had one of the uh, had an incredible time and life changing experience and and talked about it for 20, 30 years afterwards. Yep. And then something happened. And I, I think it was somebody, a, a young girl or something. Do you know the, the background oh, yeah. about what happened? Okay. There, there, were, there were two things. And, and there was the girl. This was a French girl that very sadly took her own life by jumping off the museum that is close to the, to the central station in Amsterdam, the Nemo Museum, the big green building. That's a bit yep, like yep. a ship. Oh, if you ever come to Amsterdam, oh. you'll see it for sure. It's a great museum uh, to visit. She jumped from there right onto the, the freeway that's underneath it. And this, this was used over and over and over and over again by conservative politicians to sort of prove why we need a ban on, uh, on magic mushrooms. Later turned out, this girl had been suicidal for a very long time. I think there were even suicide attempts before. So you can, you, it was really nonsense to, to, to blame it on the mushrooms there. And then after that, there came a, a story that was even more spectacular. This was a, of a tourist guy that came to uh, Amsterdam with his own car and a big dog. And he, um, uh, he skinned his dog while under the influence of magic mushrooms. This was all over the newspapers. <laughs> Later turned out and was in the news, but on page 18 in a very small article, this guy had a full-blown psychosis and never used magic mushrooms in Amsterdam. This was just at all. Amazing. But these two stories, new stories combined, uh, made the Minister of Health uh, back in the day decide to first ask, uh, like a scientific board, whether it, it, it'd be smart to uh, implement a ban on magic mushrooms. Well, they did some research. And they came to one conclusion, it's not a good idea to ban them. So then mm -hmm. the minister said, well, thank you for the advice, but I'm still the minister. Yeah, I'll chuck it here in uh, our uh, round archive and we'll proceed with the ban. And then to make the story even crazier, and I, for, what, for a few years, I couldn't believe this aspect of the story because I, I've seen a lot, but I couldn't uh, imagine that this was true. Uh, that the, the guy, the civil servant in the Ministry of uh, Health who made, who wrote the text for the magic mushroom ban, he went to Wikipedia to the, to the mushroom page, all the mushrooms, and he just copied the list from there. And it was like <laughs> 165 different mushrooms. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and he put them all in, in the law from the Wikipedia page. <laughs> so years after I heard this, and I... I I came across this guy who left the Ministry of Health because he, he, he couldn't, he could no longer, uh, his conscience was too much yeah. testing for the drug policy. So I talked to this guy and I said, I've heard this story a few years ago about the magic mushroom ban, but I could really never understand it, uh, whether this was true or not. I couldn't believe it was true. So I said, and, and, and then, yeah, yeah, it was the Wikipedia page. And then he paused for a while, dramatically, and he said, I was the civil servant, oh, that I did this, so the, the rumor oh. is true. I did use the Wikipedia thing. Oh, and then he oh also said, that's the reason why we still have the magic truffles, because a truffle is not technically a mushroom. Right. And he left it off. Yeah. Oh and he, God. He, this, this guy, yeah, he, he thought he did, he did well, and maybe he did, <laughs> because we still have the magic mushroom. And also, it's interesting. The, the kits the kits to make your own uh, uh, magic mushrooms they are still legal too so if you have some more yeah. time you can you can grow them but of course if you're yeah. as a tourist that that's no good and I think the, yeah. the, the reason is is the, the reason that city council also uh, was okay with this in Amsterdam is that and uh, you should be very careful if you generalize but you lived in Amsterdam so maybe you can also uh, attest to this a bit we get mm. a lot of british tourists that yes. are there for stack parties mm -hmm. that have really one 
one goal, if they have a stack party like this, is, is get as fucked up as they can. So yeah. not only are they pissed drunk the whole the whole time, they smoke as much as they can. And back when they could buy the mushrooms, they would they would be drunk and stoned and gobble up the mushrooms. And and then yeah, you get an ambulance mm -hmm. ride. And it's true, the figures went up. The, the the ambulance had to come often for British tourists who were just stupid. Yeah. Really stupid, yeah. you know. Uh, unfortunately, there was a predisposition for that. Yeah, I'm a proud uh, cannabis user myself, but I do also believe that especially if you are not in your own country or in your own city and you're visiting, please be a bit considerate about the people that live there. But also, you can see now how, how very fragile our policy is. And if there's pressure on there, whether it be from French politicians or, or from Christian uh, Dutch politicians, we could lose all this, you know? Yeah, That's of yeah. course the main reason that I am fighting as an activist, because I'm very aware that that even a few years back, they were really thinking of closing all the coffee shops in one go. Too much trouble, you know? Why yeah. do we have to be so different from all the other countries? The, the other countries don't have coffee shops. Let's just stop this policy right there. So I think people and, and uh, that come to, to, to the Netherlands and enjoy the freedom that we have here, just be considerate and, and be rational, rational and also uh, understand that, that, that this can have really bad effects, you know, that if we have bad press with people doing bad stuff in the, in the city, uh, yeah, it, and it'd be negative for them as well. Yeah. So do you, is the real key, is your best hope right now, honestly, Germany? Yeah. If Germany, yeah. And, and that's Germany, good. I'm, I'm very hopeful that it's not, uh, they even use this term, uh, the German experts themselves, that, if, that they don't go Luxembourg. Because Luxembourg, oh. they, when, the, when the new government came in like four years ago, they were very uh, outspoken saying, yes, we're going to legalize, we want to have shops, we want to have home grow, we have the whole uh, package there, and we were gonna implement it in this term of the government, so within four years. Then Corona came, they put out some press releases like, oh yeah, now we have too much stress because of Corona, it's not priority to have the cannabis. And then mm -hmm. the, end of this, the end of the story is for, for the time being, there will be no shops, there will only be home growing, which is a great thing, and there mm -hmm. will be legal uh, sale of seeds, which makes sense because how are you going to grow if there's no? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they were, yeah, they they sort of say, yeah, we uh, underestimated also uh, having criticism from the rest of Europe and also having the uh, international drug treaties and it's a bit complicated, uh, blah blah. And I, so that's where they stand right now. They, they have, I think mm -hmm. last week uh, said the, the law proposal, which will only be home growing and the sale of seeds and, you know, personal possession and that thing, we will have the, the law now within a few days or weeks. But mm -hmm. Germany, they are really serious about, because that's the, the literal text that they have in the government program. They talk about, uh, yeah, shops, Fachgeschäfte, like uh, specialized shops is the term that they use in the government program. So mm -hmm. they are not, I really don't expect them to go the Luxembourg way and uh, and sort of downsize this whole proposal. Because what, what happened quite recently is that uh, the, the, the Minister of Health in, in Germany, uh, Karl Lauterbach, he, he went uh, in, in, on TV, I think, as saying, firstly saying, in... Uh, uh, I was not so much a supporter of legalization before, but now I understand it's the best way to do it. And this also has to do with some, uh, you know, contaminated cannabis, like CBD cannabis that has, has uh, synthetic cannabinoids sprayed on it from China, which mm. makes a very, very dangerous uh, product. Yeah. So he, he literally said to have it forbidden is, is much more dangerous than to regulate it. And then he mm -hmm. said, we will have um, eine Zwischensport. So we have a sprint in the middle of the marathon okay. to make the legalization law be there earlier, be there sooner. So right. instead of backing off and, and saying, oh, we have other priorities and it's all much more complicated, they, they are upping, uh, upping the ante and saying, we will have 
the law proposal on the table by this uh, autumn. And we could have, but that, that I think is too optimistic, we could have the legal weed in the shops in Germany in the spring next year, spring of 2023. Imagine that'll be in time. That'll be in time for Rocktoberfest. Oh man! I actually visited Munich uh, uh, just a month ago. I've been planning yeah. my trip there a long time oh. and to see the beer culture. It was uh, it was quite strange, but an interesting phenomenal. Oh God, yeah. I did I did a beer fest or a, a Oktoberfest uh, in, in late September, just before it was all starting, but it was all set up. And it was open, so I got to go into the place, and like the Oompa Loompa band was there, yeah, but I was yeah, the yeah. only one there. It was like I had it all in my place. I smoked out through all of those places, got to go to all the tents and everything. Oh, it's going to be such an incredible party there when that goes. Oh, it's yep. going to be phenomenal. Yep. I can see that having this trickle effect, but oh, it's no. going to be really important that that the Netherlands flips over. Um, and, and kind of comes to their senses, so to speak, uh, uh, after Germany does. The, I think the longer that Amsterdam waits, uh, you know, I, the more that the unrest, look at the unrest you had over COVID. Mm. And, and if, how do you feel about that now? Do you think that, that you have a possibility of, of seeing some some relapses of COVID coming this fall and this winter. That's what I'm hearing here in, in mm -hmm. Portugal. That's what they're very worried about is fall and winter and then things getting shut down and even in Spain. And they're worried about that being that the, the coffee shops might get shut down because of any kind of a rehash. Yeah. Do you see that being a possibility? I, I do I do believe that COVID will return in some form and we could have like uh, like limited lockdowns. I don't think we will be because they have sort of learned that to really overreact, uh, say with the schools, for instance, especially for the younger children, there they, I think, learned their lesson that they have to be very careful with that and, and try to, to, to limit it. But I don't think it will have an impact on the coffee shops because that was... <laughs> One of the very, very few good aspects of the COVID worldwide pandemic is that the, our government and the, all coffee shop owners know this and, and the date, they even know the date and they will never ever <laughs> forget this moment, that the, our government way in the beginning of the pandemic in March 2019 or 20, I yeah. forget even, but when yeah, it just yeah. started, they uh, went on TV on Sunday with a press conference, like we had so many press conferences after where they have new measures, uh, they talk about new measures. And then they said, within an hour, all the coffee shops have to close in the Netherlands for the next two months. So, and then, it, 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 yeah, it would be within the hour. So mm -hmm. all the news media reported what happened after that is that immediately, <laughs> even during the press conference, the lines <laughs> that were forming in front of the coffee shops, they even they never even saw it in the Soviet Union. They were going mm -hmm. around the block, it'd be crazy. So that was one thing. But the other thing, and this was also reported and on TV, is that while this, the big line was standing there in front of the coffee shops, the dealers were actually going to the people that were in line, giving out their business cards saying, if they are closed, you know, I'm here. Call. I'll bring it right to your door. We have the great wheat. So they could see what <laughs> normally you cannot see out in the open because that's why it's a black market and it's all underground. But now all the all the, the reporters, they could see it in front of their eyes. First, mm -hmm. there is a huge demand for wheat. You know, people really, they, they, they dropped everything and, and immediately <laughs> went to the shop to get the, the last wheat that they could uh, normally buy in the coffee shop. But the second uh, aspect, even more important maybe, is that there are so many dealers ready to take over the market at any chance that they can. So mm -hmm. what happened then is, uh, is the next, within 24 hours, the next day on the Monday, there was another press release. <laughs> and Oops. Said, the coffee shops, will be allowed to open immediately, directly, yeah. but uh, only to uh, have takeaway sales. So you cannot sit yeah. inside the coffee shop and smoke your joint. But you, And this, I think, never in the history of Dutch politics has there been a decision made so, so fast to have the 
360 uh, change there and they, they saw it. So I use it a lot in articles too and, and uh, the coffee shop owners rightly do it as well. Ever since that date, we know uh, what they, what they, in Canada, they did it as well. A dispensary, a cannabis store is an essential service. Like mm -hmm. a supermarket for your food, it's also essential service to, to, to be able to get your weed somewhere. And this, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you know about it. The coffee shops, they have such a bad press. You know, a lot of people piss on it. The politicians, they hate it. But now th this was their glorious moment when, when the politicians, they had to, yeah, they had to agree, okay, uh, you have to open up because you are very, very important in the society. Yeah, this is a necessary service that you provide here. And, and you know, the other thing, which, which we can't really talk about too much because it's not really verified, uh, I don't think. I know that there's been several studies, but, you know, there's, there's, uh, they've talked about the fact that people who smoke on uh, somewhat of a regular basis, and I think it was both THC and CBD or a combination of the both, uh, it seems to have some sort of inhibiting effect on the receptors that uh, kick out the cytokines when you catch the COVID. And what they basically said was that you, it had this kind of a barrier that it created here that prevented your, um, these, uh, from from uh, causing a cytokine storm, and and I always imagine having you know a little tiny cheech over here and a chong over here. Hey man, no, you can't come in here, man. This is we're busy, man. You can't Go come in. <laughs> Dan uh, Hooter's not here, man. You're gonna have to hit the road. Uh, <laughs> uh, good times for the guys up in the top of my head here. The uh, do you think that you uh, that we talked a little bit about the magic mushrooms, but you know there's there's a lot of laws around the United States where they're trying to legalize uh, the full magic mushrooms for medicinal purposes. Yep. Um, and for uh, do you think just because you can go get your own kits uh, if you really need it, there there's no kind of purpose behind doing that uh, there because you know if you had some sort of medicinal need, you can just go down and go buy your own kit and grow your own. I, I say bring back uh, magic mushrooms to the shops. Mm -hmm. There was one, uh, this was the same man that we talked about at the beginning, who was very uh, uh, smart about the tourist ban, who explained immediately on TV, we can't have this. He said when they were talking about the, the, the magic mushroom ban, wouldn't it be a good idea, because he also see the British tourists, you know, they take too much, whatever, is that if you want to buy magic mushrooms in the shop, you have to apply for it 24 hours before. You cannot walk into the store and get your mushrooms. If you want them, you can say, okay, I want them and pick them up tomorrow and then you can have them and maybe also limit the amount that you can buy in one go. Because mm -hmm. indeed, I, I agreed with the mayor that was there back then, is that the, the problem is that if you're already drunk and high and doing so many drugs and you yeah. walk in and, and you, you eat them on the spot, this kind of like say not uh, not very irresponsible behavior, behavior. Irresponsible yeah behavior. <laughs> this is what you should target right and and so it, i think yeah to his credit he, he put this really as a serious proposal uh, to the health minister say if you do this you help me without you know having uh, having needing a, a total ban like that and i right. what i like it a good example uh, or good proof on how these things work uh, I I think I did magic mushrooms like six times in my life and all mm -hmm. six times were like a great experience but mm -hmm. but very different for me than, than than smoking my weed which I do every day so I, I think that even the day before the tourist ban I went into the smart shop and bought like two doses of Mexican uh, magic mushrooms I still mm -hmm. have them in my closet and I know that really? they will not lose much of their uh, potency. They're just mm -hmm. right out now mm -hmm. and I can use mm -hmm. them. But to me, it's like, and when they were still uh, for sale normally here at the smart shop, very close to my house, it was not like I was going to buy them every week and do a mushroom tri trip every week. This is a very mm -hmm. different kind of a drug from say like coffee or wheat or you know your daily drugs. And I think right. it works so for, for, for most people. And then it's all like with most uh, drug policy issues, 
it all comes down to giving good information to people, you know, and being right. honest about the facts and all this. Exactly. And, you know, it, for those of you who have not been to Amsterdam or were, weren't there during the time when they were selling magic mushrooms, most of the smart shops uh, had a range, usually five or six different types of, of mushroom cultivars from mild uh, all the way to, you know, Hawaiian-esque uh, uh, stronger mushrooms. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to have uh, Ian Bollinger on uh, later this week, uh, who is the gentleman that runs the psilocybin cup. Uh, in San Francisco, oh, wow. in California, and he's a uh, a scientist and uh, uh, a, a whole bunch of other uh, uh, expertises in this field. And he's going to talk a little bit about how you rate and review and judge uh, psilocybin uh, mushrooms, which I'm really excited to learn about. I will say that one of my all time favorite mushroom experiences were in was right in the center of of Amsterdam. Uh, walking, I, I must have walked 20 miles that night, uh, covered every great city. I mean, we went everywhere and it was just one of the, I will always remember it because this the city is so beautiful and especially in the, the right time of year and it's just a little bit of cold, but not too cold and uh, fresh enough that you can walk around and enough tourists. And at nighttime, the lights are just so magnificent in that city. And it is a shame because if there's any city that you should be able to have mushrooms in, it should be Amsterdam. Absolutely. Uh, what the, for the VOC now, uh, you guys have a wonderful podcast uh, that you've been doing now a couple of years, right? It's, but it's not, I'm the, one of the hosts, but it's not really VOC related in that respect. We, we, it's called the IT Podcast, podcast spelled with a T. And I do it with my good friend, uh, Rens Hoppenbrouwers, who used to work in one of the best coffee shops here in the South, uh, in Tilburg, Tourmaline. And he's a, yeah, he's a good Ooh. friend of mine. He's a, a, quite a bit younger. So we sort of play with that dynamic. I'm like the old mm -hmm. dude, you know, the encyclopedia and all this old stuff. And he is more like the, the, the younger guy. And it really works also well with the kind of, uh, we put our networks together, the kind of people that he knows, the kind of people that I know. So that, that works very well. And um, indeed, we, if we have Dutch people on the show, we just do it in Dutch. But if we have uh, non-Dutch yeah. speakers, we do them in, uh, in English. So you were actually one of the first uh, guests we had on the show, Captain, which was great. Fantastic. Yep. So yeah, if Loved you it. put it in the show notes, just uh, we have this website and it's very easy to uh, click. You get the English episodes that we've done, I think by now 10. Mm -hmm. And the total amount, yeah, we've done 60 episodes. We do mostly, we do them like uh, twice a month. Mm -hmm. And what's, what's good about it for us stoners is that it's not like on the radio that we have to do it on the Tuesday or the Wednesday or whatever. So... For instance, when we were in Barcelona for the Spanabis last time, uh, we made like three episodes there because so many interesting people, of course, show up in, uh, in Barcelona for the event. And then we, we spread them out like, uh, like bi-weekly. For me, it's great to do because, I'm, as you know, my, uh, my background is like a writing journalist, you know, for magazines and, mm -hmm. and websites. So to be able to just uh, do what we are doing right now and just babble along, talk about our favorite subject, it's really... Uh, it's nice to do all all day every day absolutely now now you've been to barcelona many times i know and uh, do you have a favorite uh a club there that is your favorite yeah it, it used to be one that so that's no use to tip it because it's uh, unfortunately closed down but the one that is still open and that i would say is my favorite is the backyard Oh yeah, it's a very small. No, it's not that small, but it's quite a small club, and I think the atmosphere is just fantastic. It really, to me, it's like th that that thing that the best coffee shops uh, have in the Netherlands that are really uh, not too commercial, nice atmosphere, really people wanting to to make a good time for you that are really friendly and interested in your story, and th that all it, it's all there in the backyard. And then their mm -hmm. menu is, is just spectacular. Not cheap, but mm -hmm. really the, the kind of wheat I smoke there, I cannot find anywhere in the coffee shops here. I have to go yeah. directly to the growers to find that kind of a quality. <laughs> and, 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 you know, there is something that has to do with, with membership also to a certain extent that having a place where it, uh, in, in the United States, there used to be a TV show called Cheers. Yep. And, and it was, a, the, I think part of the theme song was uh, going to a place where everyone knows your name. And 
uh, the, it is the one element that that again, if you don't live in in Amsterdam on a regular basis, if you're just a tourist or whatever, you never really get a chance to experience what it feels like to be have this be your home coffee shop here and with these clubs in Barcelona and even in Madrid and down at Guelph and stuff, you feel like you're part of a family quickly. Yep. Uh, normally the hospitality part of it is, is next level. Yep. Uh, that, that, that is the one thing that you kind of, again, you don't get a chance to get that often in, in Amsterdam because you're mostly they're, they're tourists that are just kind of whipping, whipping through. Um, so I, again, I'm excited. I'm hoping that uh, your efforts eventually will be uh, re uh, rewarded. I was going to ask you one other question. You created and you um, hosted the last big cannabis celebration uh, day. Uh, and, and, and that was a couple of years ago now. Uh, and, and I remember you after that, you were tired. Um, uh, you had just, I mean, you had put everything into that event. And I remember you going, that's the last one. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, uh, okay. Have, have you got the itch back yet? Are you gonna do another one? Are you still? Uh, I got this question and I, I think it's <laughs> that I do get it because so many people remember uh, this event, Cannabis Liberation it, Day. It was awesome. Well, uh, you, you could say that, that, that the event was like the victim of its own success that we got, we wanted to grow every year and we did. And then we grow so big that we needed so much sponsor money and we needed to organize really, really all year round. We, we, we had to put the whole year, we were working on, on having this, this, uh, this one day event. And that's, that's one of the main reasons that we thought it'd be better uh, to quit because the the VOC is, is like a real NGO. We have to do a lot of stuff because lobbying to the politicians, th there's not much of people doing that at all. You have right. like two coffee shop unions that do it, but they are, of course, a bit more special interest. You know, they are there for the coffee shops and they should be. But to, 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 to really go out there and also advocate for, for patients, for, for hemp, for home growing, for people not being evicted for home growing, Nobody looks after these people. Nobody goes into the media uh, explaining uh, what this plant really is about. So we need a lot of time to do that. And to me, it, it, it was quite a hard decision, but I could see that so much energy went into this one event and it was great, but it, it, it did mean that for the other important stuff that we should also be doing, there, there was just too little time to do that. And also I must say that uh, yeah, like we talked about in the beginning, even Dutch people had no clue when we started out with cannabis liberation, and most of them at least, that it was all still illegal. You know? <laughs> so so crazy. to even get that basic message, no, the policy is not right. No, there is a lot of problems. And, and to say, yeah, it's illegal still in the Netherlands. After 10 editions, because we did 10 in total from 2009, uh, up until 2018, we could say that that goal we reached, you know, the, the, the guy in the street and, and the, the main media, by then they had figured out, oh, there's something wrong with the cannabis policy. It's still illegal. So uh, that's what, and then from then on, we started putting a lot more time and effort and energy into uh, lobbying on the national and local levels to... Uh, to make them understand, you know, that we need to change this policy and we can. They don't have to be uh, afraid for it. So as an example, just uh, earlier this month, we, we uh, launched a, a new uh, brochure. This is the seventh one in a series that we do. We have the, the, the new chancellor, the new government guy of uh, Germany, Olaf Scholz. Yeah. And this is the main argument that we make in this brochure. We always have this, this very nice drawing at the back. Oh, that's you can cool. See that cannabis has been in the Netherlands such a very long time. It's nothing new. Wow. So we, we try yeah. to explain to these politicians and we send these brochures also to journalists and to mayors and to judges, whoever has a stake in, in, in the debate to, to, to make them understand that they that we are no, no longer the only country in the world that is you know moving ahead. And, and moving forward with cannabis policy and legalizing and 
and understanding how much how much good this plant uh, has to offer humanity because we, we didn't even get into like uh, climate change and what the hemp can mean for climate change you know hemp building hemp uh, hemp creeds, all the products that are already there so we yeah that's the that's the, the long uh, answer to the question so yeah of course sometimes i think we should have a, a new event but i do still think it was a wise decision for the voc as long as we have so many more problems that have to be solved is to to try to focus uh, on that and then, then i say and i mean this if we do get a moment that we have a like a, for instance a comprehensive cannabis law and and we have the dates for instance that home growing will be legal then we're going to have one more cannabis liberation day. Yeah, sure. maybe. We'll do oh, it one yeah. more time and it'd be bigger and better than, than ever. That would be awesome, dude. Yeah. But listen, thank you. I appreciate you taking the time and, and squaring everything up now. I think I understand now exactly what's going on. Um, I wish you the very best of luck in all of this. Uh, and and uh, and I'm now gonna go join a fan club of the Chancellor of uh, Germany because the that that we know that that's really the trigger that needs to uh, be pulled here. So thank you, my friend. I'll hope to see you again soon, and uh, I'll be back there in September for the Jack Herrera Cup. So I'll be seeing you then. Great. Looking forward. All the best. Thank you, sir. Well, hey everybody, welcome back, dude. They're still firing missiles. I can't get rid of this guy's master. It's hard being a superhero. What did I tell you about that interview, though? Isn't Derek amazing? I love that guy. He really, really, really knows his stuff. I did! I saved the city! Dude, how cool is that? Oh. Alright, that's a great way to end the show. Listen... I'll see you guys on Saturday. We have an amazing show with real, serious, OG legend. Oh my God. Adam L. Brooke, the guy who did the hash bash. It's going to be a great show. I'll see you guys on Saturday. It's Captain Hooter. Far out, man.